So welcome, everybody. Welcome to a conversation I'm going to have with a woman I admire very much, Ellen Gustafson. And she has just released We the Eaters. Uh, she is quite a powerful woman. And she's put together two things, food and writing, which are usually very quiet, small things in this small book uh, with a very powerful message. And it's pretty revolutionary. So I, I want to welcome you to Google. Thank you. And thank you for coming. Thanks for having me. So um, why should we be eating? And even more important than that, why should we be eating dinner, which is one of your main points? Uh, and dinner just sounds so traditional. You know, we sit down to dinner. Grandma, mom makes uh, roast chicken. But why is eating dinner together now, uh, such a revolutionary act. You've, you've put it on these pages for us. Can you tell us? It's interesting to kind of frame food in a lot of the different areas of, of you know, our lives and of mm -hmm. global issues that sometimes don't, food doesn't get, you know, kind of plugged into. Obviously, we, we know that food is incredibly connected to our health and our personal health and maybe even community health. But sometimes we miss a lot of the other elements that food brings us to. And in this book, I talk a lot about p politics, big global politics yeah. issues, but also even relationships at, at a much more personal level. And so dinner, you know, is, is such an iconic um, example of when the family, the, the really, the very small body politic gets together and, and talks and, you know, the family life is really born from that experience of spending time together and, and mm -hmm. talking and learning and learning about family history and learning about the food itself. And it's really something that we've, we've, many of us have lost. And I think that that can then be sort of extrapolated to a lot of other big picture issues where if, if this meal is something that we think of as just a throwaway, cheap, drive, you know, pick up on the way home, drive through, we'll think about what that's done to culture in general and then to a lot of these other big global issues. I think the, the very radical act of sitting down with people you live with or care about is, is uh, so compelling now in the days when people stand by their kitchen sink and eat, uh, or as you say, drive by, uh, or don't, don't even eat. Maybe it's just a snack. Uh, maybe it's a, a piece of uh, something that you can put boiling water on and be through eating in, in five minutes. Um, what brought you to this? Why, why did you put it th at the center of your life? Well, I didn't actually start working on food issues at all. Um, you know, I myself am an eater. I love to eat. And I think as a, as a woman, especially as a young woman, you know, eating actually posed a lot of challenges for me. I mean, even just fitting into your genes is, is challenging in, in our modern <laughs> culture of food. And so that, that was always something in the back of my head just as a young person growing up in America and being frustrated that, you know, you, you hit a point where everyone notices, okay, I guess you're, you're, you're going to be at the age now where you're going to start gaining weight. And that seems like a, a foregone on conclusion in our modern society, which is, is silly. It shouldn't be the case. Yeah. But actually, my work, my professional life, and my focus was much more on big global issues like terrorism and security issues. And I was, uh, when I was in a senior in college in New York City, 9-11 happened. I was very, very focused on understanding terrorism and why why these things happen in the world and, and what's gone on in our, in our modern society that led to this really radical shift in people's beliefs about Americans and about Western culture. And actually those two things together brought me to my current work. And it seems kind of crazy, but in, in one of my jobs working on terrorism issues as, as an investigative reporter, I was looking at the, the global map of, of terrorism and places where terrorist groups are operating. And I, I also randomly saw this this map from the World Food Program, the hunger map, and noticed that, my God, they're incredibly similar. Places around the world where people are hungry mm. are always connected to places around the world where people are violent and uprisings occur and terrorism then eventually festers and happens. And that, to me, was such an unbelievable link and connection. And it led me to switch from working on terrorism to working on fundamental food security and hunger and kind of move along in my career in a totally different way. So interesting to me that you went from the sexier topic of, if you will, oh, terrorism. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, if, if it bleeds, it leads kind of exactly. investigative yep. uh, reportage that brought you to this way quieter, 
less sexy subject, but so fundamental Absolutely. To, to, to culture, society, politics. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, people miss that. The, yeah. we, we think of the, the sort of, you know, after effects. How are we going to fight these people? How are we going to fight terrorism? Yeah. And not maybe the, the fundamental issues of how are we going to prevent? And it's actually the same thing we look at when we look at health. Instead of thinking of how are we going to prevent disease, we think of how we're going to fight disease. And it's this whole sort of look at, at, you know, fighting the problem after it happens instead of preventing these issues from ever yes. happening again. So all the downstream things that are so much more easy to talk about than the fundamental things. Right, up, exactly, upstream. exactly. So, so okay, so 9-11, tell us a little of the personal journey that brought you to what you do today, because you have done so many things. You're called an activist, <laughs> but you're really a, a person who cares so much about fundamental values. So yeah, I mean, I, I didn't really start as an activist. I, I mo shifted over from my work as, as a journalist to the UN World Food Program itself, working in the organization. It's the largest humanitarian organization in the world. And, and I started my job there as a public information officer, as a spokesperson. Mm -hmm. And so one of my jobs was talking to the media and getting them to understand hunger and why they should care about hunger. And of course, I always brought in this angle that we should care about hunger because we care about terrorism and the downstream effects. But also, we were looking for ways to get young people engaged in hunger. Actually, when I started working there in 2006, although you know food security now is maybe a little bit sexier, it really wasn't at all then. And, uh, and I met one of the celebrity ambassadors uh, that, that was you know, representing the UN World Food Program. And she and I kind of developed this idea to start a company that sold products. The, the project products were called feed bags. And each feed bag sold would give money back to the UN World Food Program to raise money and to raise awareness about the problem of hunger and let people have you know, a tangible way to give. And it was funny, we, we started this company in a complete vacuum, really, in, you know, in New York, but not really knowing there was a whole movement. And Tom Shoes, this other sort of iconic accessories brand about giving back, was starting at the exact same time. So there was almost this zeitgeist um, happening around this whole social entrepreneurship movement and caring about global issues, but through your consumer dollars. And so starting Feed was you know, a huge, a huge thing for me. It was a, you know, an incredible experience running a business, a fashion business, but also getting people to care through their consumer mm. purchases about this issue of hunger. But eventually, um, as, as kind of my years um, working on global hunger continued, I had this aha moment that I talk about in the book where I was in Uganda working on hunger issues, as you might expect, and went into a store to, tr to get food to take with me out to a day's work in the field, you know, visiting projects that we were funding and visiting different you know, things that aid organizations were working on and going into a little store in this small city in Uganda, I mean, really not, not Kampala, not, you know, not Entebbe, not one of the main cities. And it was literally packed with junk. And I remembered driving through these like dirt roads, there's soda, there's like pr Pringles are like everywhere. I don't know how they get everywhere. There's ice cream in so many places that have barely safe water and, 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 and chips and packaged, you know, wheat, uh, sweets and pastries. And I was like, how have we got somehow this system where we can get people Coca-Cola literally in 200 countries, more countries than are recognized by the UN, and somehow we can't get healthy, basic, food that's grown locally and it really struck me when I flew back to the states and went into one of those like Hudson News stores that you know they're in like every airport and it's literally all junk it's the same stuff and it, I had this aha moment of like wait a minute this is much more similar than it is different our problems at home of obesity and fitting into our jeans and everybody gaining weight and all and all the health problems related to that and this thing this hunger problem that I've been working on that seems so far away are so much more similar than they are different and then I started working on the connection between the two and eventually this book. <laughs> Beautiful. So, so it's malnutrition. It's, it's yeah. eating bad food. Exactly. Food that causes disease and, and doesn't maintain and sustain you. What a, what a journey. And, and feed, I take, has, uh, did I read that you fed six million? Well, yes. Yeah, so actually the, the numbers today of feed, which has continued and been really successful over the years since we started in 2007, they have provided 80 million school meals to kids around the world. And while I was there, it was 60 million. So the, the numbers keep going. And, and, and you know what's interesting, too, the timing of my own journey is while I was at Feed, starting in 2006, in 2008, there was this global food crisis, and, and hunger was skyrocketing. And so we were doing, we were at our best year. We were providing so many, you know, millions of school meals. 
but the problem of hunger was growing so dramatically and it really made me think that there's something so much bigger here. The system is really the problem. Mm. This is not something that we can just only throw money at. We have to figure out fundamentally how to change this system. And how should we change the system? Well, and so that's where, where, where yeah. should each one of us begin? Well, it comes, I, I eventually through thinking and researching and, and you know, writing this book, but also just really deeply looking at how the interconnection between our food system at home and these food systems I'd seen overseas is, you know, Americans decide what the world eats. And if you, if you, the more you travel, the more you see it. In, in countries and cultures that people have always eaten incredible traditional diets and diverse crops from their own you know, regions and soils, now more and more it's what we eat. <laughs> and, it, and it's our varieties and it's our agricultural systems. And it made me think that you know, Americans have a huge responsibility. Mm. Hence, we the eaters. You know, we have a huge responsibility to understand that our eating habits themselves have a massive impact around the world. And if we don't get them right, if we export the junk food and the fast food and the soda, as we have been doing, that is what the world is going to look like. They're going to look just like us as they're starting to do. And so if we get it right here at home, if we figure out how to make a system work, like we've figured out how to get cell phones to be really successful, and now there's more African cell phone consumers than there are North American yeah. cell phone consumers, we can do that with food systems. We just haven't figured out yet how. Yeah, and I think China and India are vying uh, for diabetes capital of the world. Yeah, uh, Mexico. I mean, uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, all of these countries. And, and it's, it's not because their own people are somehow changed and lazy, like, like the messaging we hear, and their personal responsibility has gone down the toilet. No, it's because they're eating more and more of the Western diet. Yeah, it's, the, it's the fast food diet. And, and it, it, um, it, it fits in such a weird way uh, and so quickly into their cultures. I think what it took America since the 50s mm. uh, in the last century to do, it's taking them 10, 20 years to, to get to this place of disease and, and non-health. Well, and the flip side of that, you know, is that you know, we built this system, the fast food system, the soda system, the junk food proliferation system, and it works really well. And we've, we've, we've perfected it, and now it works really well. And so there is absolutely no reason we can't do that with healthy foods. It's not like a, mm. a foregone conclusion that this is the only food that we can make in a way that's you know, produced and, and available. The systems have to be different, but we can, and, and actually you know, you're, we're, here we are in, in the Bay Area and we can see that the alternative can work. You know, almost every small place you go into now in the San Francisco Bay Area has some semblance of local purchasing or healthier food or green juice or kale. <laughs> and, and, you more know, kale and more kale and more kale. And, more kale. <laughs> and, and so the fact is we can, we can make these systems work for healthier foods. Mm. It's just a matter of you know, the entrepreneurs and the, and the eaters joining forces to, to make, make the better system mm. work. It, it, it is going to look different though, right? People sitting, you envision a future where we sit down to dinner together. It, it may be an, a traditional nuclear family. It may be me and a friend on a webcam across the country, or what, what would it look like? Tell us, give us an idea what you see. Well, it's funny. I mean, we've obviously kept eating dinner. You know, that hasn't gone away. We just have, what, we, what we've eaten has changed so dramatically. And mm -hmm. so I think sometimes, you know, I, I'm always kind of amused to, to say, to say, I guess that's the only way to describe it, when people talk about how incredibly busy they are and how they have to stay at work and that's why they can't cook dinner. And these are not people that have their finger on the big red button. I mean, we're, we're just people that are working our jobs. Like we, we, that's a culture shift that we can take mm -hmm. some control of and say, no, it's actually important to go home and eat dinner with people and sit and take the time. Um, so I, I think that's something that we have to really invest mm -hmm. time and energy into as a culture shift. And it's, it's totally possible. But the flip side is we have to find ways to make the healthier food options more available and, and you know, I hate to say it, but easier. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's, it's ridiculous that the easiest thing is this wildly subsidized, you know, actually incredibly expensive hamburger meal is somehow the cheapest and easiest thing. And we have got to find ways and we have to find the entrepreneurs and we have to find the systems and the farmers and the politics and the policies that work to make the easier thing and the cheaper thing, the healthier thing, like it always should have been. And, and so you're saying, have a hamburger, have it uh, maybe not so often, go buy your grass-fed beef, um, buy a, a beautiful artisan-made bread, maybe whole wheat, 
and uh, nothing wrong with the hamburger, but make Absolutely. it from scratch. Yeah, right? I mean, I try, I mean, myself, I love burgers, so I'm, I'm certainly never going to tell anyone to eat a certain right. diet, um, and I'm not a nutritionist and, or, nor a doctor, and I don't, you know, that's not my role, I think, but I think we've gotten so far off kilter that the only way to be healthy is to eschew foods, but the reason that we think that is because the foods are actually not really the foods. You know, I mean, the burger that you think of that you might get at a fast food restaurant is certainly terrible for you. But it's not because red meat itself is the, the devil or, you know, we shouldn't be eating these entire food groups. I think we, what we've done to the food group, what the modern version of the food group is, is certainly like a bastardized version. Mm -hmm. But it's not the food itself. And that's something I think we're, we're wrestling with. And I think as young people, as, you know, sort of there's a generation uh, my friends, my, you know, my generation is, is starting to really think differently. Like, do we want to spend the rest of our lives on a highly restrictive diet? Or do we want to really think about where our, our food comes from? And maybe that is the restrictive diet that helps us both main, you know, maintain our health goals and our weight goals, but also happens to be better for the whole world and the environment mm -hmm. too. Yeah, and I think it is, it is starting to happen, um, yeah. some, some of the research that's coming out. So my, I have one more question before I open the conversation up to everybody uh, in the room, which is, y you were a, a journalist, and, and so what made you say, I'm going to stop investigating and reporting about it, I'm actually going to do something about it? That, that's a very courageous switch to make. What, what, what happened in here or in here? Well, I think, I think first of all, just incredible frustration mm. and and you know maybe more than a journalist at my so, my core I'm more of an entrepreneur because I, I I love when people say no and that just means I have to find a way around it <laughs> um, but but I think you know it, it's it's so frustrating to to read about especially health in our country and to read about the environment in our country and to read about Gl global hunger, children starving in a, con in, in a world of, of, you know, well enough calories for everybody to survive yeah. and thrive. And, and just to, be, to, to see that and read that and, and report on it was really personally very frustrating. And, 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 and then to work on the flip side at a major organization, the World Food Program, which does so much good work, but to even see in that organization how our American food system has in some ways even bastardized food aid. You know, we're, we're giving a lot of corn and soy excess that American farmers are growing probably too much of, sending it overseas, and then embedding those systems of corn-based food systems mm -hmm. in countries around the world that where people are, you know, needy, where they should be growing their own local foods that probably are healthier. And so all of this together, seeing this so clearly, you know, it's, I just couldn't stand aside anymore and, and, you know, watch it without trying to find ways to fix it and change it. Wonderful story. And, and so, I, and I think this, the book will tell more, but you've, you've done many other activities, entrepreneurial as well as policy stuff that, that's really exciting. Thank you so much for doing what you do. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm going to let everybody else join in the conversation if you have uh, questions. Um, Ellen is happy to answer them. What, what would you tell to a Coca-Cola exec or, or a Pepsi exec? And it's funny because Pepsi just released a, a real sugar drink, which is funny that they have to put that label on the bottle <laughs> to begin with. Um, but what would you tell them to make their case of, yeah, you're making millions, billions of dollars, but we want you to do this instead? What's the case for them saying, I agree? Well, what's interesting is that I feel especially coming into this in to, you know talk, right this book being released in 2014 is I almost don't have to tell them anything because the marketplace is telling them everything you know the the young women myself included who in college used to drink diet coke thinking that that was the healthier option are wildly moving away from drinks like that because of the artificial ingredients and I don't see where the future is for those products when the you know hardcore consumer of of those products is now just completely leaving, they're not coming back. You know, it's not like all of a sudden I'm gonna, you know, ha start feeding Diet Coke to my children in the future, you know? So I think that's, that th the, the consumer has spoken in many ways. And so what, what's been interesting to watch is a couple of things. Coca-Cola specifically is investing a lot more in water. They're investing a ton in juice. Um, they're investing in, you know, even in, in juice facilities overseas, they've done some interesting projects in Africa building 
mango juice processing facilities for African consumers because you know the, the messages are going are trickling around the world so much faster because of obviously tools like Google and, and the internet but people are people are learning about health not just here as Western consumers but everywhere so people are drinking less soda because they're realizing the impacts of it so I think that's that's really interesting that Coke is hearing that message without people ma you know major activists or whatever speaking about it but what's also interesting though is that you know, it's a system that they live in. So one of the things, you know, there's this, there's this really interesting nonprofit in, in Africa, uh, I think it's called Cola Life, but what they use is the same facilities and, and logistics infrastructure that brings soda to literally every corner of the planet is now being used to bring medicine and just basic needs for communities. And what's interesting is that's great, and that is using the system for better, right? Bringing medicine to people who need it. But isn't it really the system that we have to think about? Should we have a centralized American company based in Atlanta providing beverages for the entire world? I don't know. You know, what's, what's funny about food is it's, it's not a widget. It's not a cell phone. You know, it's great that you can make widgets and cell phones in one factory centralized, probably in Asia, you know, highly replicable and mechanized. That unfortunately is not what food is. And I don't think that most eaters want food to go that way. So I think what we have to really you know, investigate is, is can Coca-Cola be successful in a decentralized way? Can they really just be a holding company for a lot of local companies that do their own business and their own production around the world? Is there a way for them to succeed in an environment where people don't want super centralized food systems and they want you know, local and healthier, more fresh food. And I think that's their challenge. I think they're listening to it and they're trying to figure that out. Yeah, it may be fortunately rather than unfortunately that, yeah. that food is so local. Yeah, I mean, and, 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 it and, and, and it's so, you know, I mean, no one else can sleep for you. No one else can exercise for you. I don't know why we've become conditioned to think that somebody else can eat for you or can cook every single thing you're gonna put in your mouth. And we, we know, you know, those machines, people laugh. It's so funny, I, I always think of this image, but you know that machine where you stood there and like the band would like shake you back and forth? Okay, everyone laughs at that, but that's exactly what we do with food. We think we can just stand there and have somebody else give it to us. And we, we, we know how ridiculous it is that that machine can't exercise for us, but we don't see how ridiculous the same thing is that we just stand there with a conveyor belt of food coming into our mouths. Great image. But, but it really is something we have Great to think image. about. <laughs> Although I want one of those machines because it looks like a lot of fun. A lot of jiggling. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Helen. So I'm skipping to the, the last part of your book because I think anyone that is um, trying to make a change and whether they're improving their food literacy skills or just trying to make a change in general, you offer the 30 shifts, uh, the 30 points here. And I guess the question is, for maybe you specifically, what were some of the ones that you grasped on early on to make a change? And what would be some of the ones to throw out to the audience as simple things as early wins? Because trying to make a complete change in how you deal with food, see food, consume food is daunting, especially you know, the longer you've been eating. Um, and so for someone that's trying to make a change, where would some of the tips be to say, hey, start with this, and try this, and then go to the next one? That's a great question. You know, what's interesting is I think People come at food for mostly, I think, for health reasons. And, and so I think those tend to be, the health-related changes tend to be the easiest for people to understand. Cutting sugar, you know, cutting back the sugar. Just reading labels and noticing if sugar or a form of sugar is the first ingredient, this is probably not a great food to be eating. Um, cutting out high fructose corn syrup is something that actually, you know, especially my generation of young moms is just wildly shifting their purchasing habits. Um, you know, looking for that product and just saying I'm not buying something with that product in it is, is a really interesting change. Shifting to healthier raised meats is something a lot of, I think, young, aware consumers are doing. And then, you know, paying attention to vegetables and fruits and saying, can I get something that's more in season? Can I get something that's organic? Can I get something that's local? Th that's all so much easier now. The proliferation of farmers markets and CSAs and ways to buy directly from local farms is is really a radical shift in like the last 10 to 15 years. And so that's, it's, it's easy and, and it's, I don't, I say that sitting in San Francisco, but I really want to stress that I do a lot of speaking on college campuses and I was in, I was at the University of South Dakota in April and I, I, I witnessed the most incredible 
array of student uh, food projects. They, they actually made different foods, which was like the greatest job ever. I got to taste all the stuff that they made. But, uh, you know, raw whole milk from a local dairy, stuff from the farmer's market that's twice a week in Vermilion, South Dakota. Um, I went to the Easter, uh, Eastern Kentucky University on the day that they had a farmer's market and they offered me a vegan option in the cafeteria. So this is not stuff that's just happening in our bubble of, you know, the Bay Area. It, it's, it's actually really happening all across the country, which is amazing. And really important, I think. So I think those health-related food changes are a great start. But I also included some steps. One of them, I think, you know, just to highlight it, I think is so interesting, is to try to walk to your meal. And it's something, you know, young people want walkable environments. We, all, we, we go to college, we can like walk to get everything, and then all of a sudden you go out to the rest of, the whole rest of the universe, and unless you live in a major city, you literally can't walk to get anything. But I think that idea of livable communities where you can just walk to buy a food item is something that is, is, helps to shift our, our societies. And so that, that is like a non-food related change, but something that I think a lot of people would become aware of and say, wow, can I walk to get a piece of food? Maybe not, and maybe is that something I would like to investigate and try to figure out? Um, and, and then I, you know, the other thing is, of course, a big thing, but getting people to just try to cook is so, you know, it is, it's, I always was frustrated a couple years ago during the Occupy movement, and this became one of the points in my book, is, is you know, if you want to really be a radical, occupy your kitchen. You know, don't, don't st sit there at these, like, you know, sleeping on a tent where you clearly can't cook for yourself, and you would see the images where there's, like, the big thing of Coca-Cola and Heinz ketchup and, you know, wherever, and I'm like, are you serious? You're trying to ra you know, rail against large companies, but you're literally ingesting the large companies. Like, talk about taking it from the man. You are eating the man right now. And, you know, so I always think if, if you want to be a, a, a radical, if you want to, you know, really, like, be the change, the first thing you can do is cook. And it, you know, it doesn't matter what you make, even. You're just kind of saying, screw the man by getting in the kitchen. And so I, I think, you know, whether you come at it from that kind of more political side or you come at it from the health side, there's so many things that do add up to major changes in our food economy. Sure. And maybe even a step before that, too, is before even knowing your kitchen, knowing your food, would be planning some things, too. So there's a lot of people out there that are farming. They look all around the Google campuses. There's gardens everywhere. But would you say that more and more people are getting back into understanding a little bit of how to farm, even if it's just a pot of herbs? You can get herbs in almost any supermarket now. Yeah. And that might be another way to kind of engage people to understand, you know, oh, this is basil, or this is what this tastes like. Yeah, totally. I mean, it's, it's interesting, you know, it, it's, it's, first of all, it's really rewarding. And I think most people see that even with, with a small pot of herbs that, and it's very prolific too. Like, you can get so much food from a single plant and you can do so much with, with relatively little. And I think that's actually a great wake-up call for people like, oh, wow. The reason that, you know, when, when food stamps started, uh, one of the main reasons that people got food stamps was to get seeds because it's wildly less expensive to buy a seed and then grow all the food yourself. You know, so I think people are starting to wake up to that. But also, there's an, an amazing movement of young people interested in agriculture itself. Young people farming, woofing, you know, going around the world, staying on farms and, and volunteering. And, and, and in America, you know, people interning at farms and apprenticing at farms. And it's not like kids that are growing up just in farmland that want to, it's actually a lot of kids that are growing up in suburban America who are like, I, I have no idea where my food comes from. Maybe that's something I should learn. And so it's very cool to see the whole spectrum of people being interested in growing. Yeah. I think that that is an inevitable. If you start cooking and you keep asking questions, it goes, where does that come from? Yeah. Where and where does that come from? And and maybe at some point you get to the health of the soil. Which well, which is also huge. I mean, you know, that's what, right. it's funny because your original point about how, you know, it's terrorism and these, some of these, you know, even, even, even local security issues and inner city security issues, all those things seem much more sexy, but what's really sexy is actually the soil. And, and when, you, when, you, when you look at a big, massive cornfield where most of our, you know, corn-based ingredients come from, it is, dead soil with nothing growing in it and just like a, a sprout of crop coming up out of it miraculously. And that I think is a really great education for people to see, you know, that's not really how stuff is supposed to grow. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think more and more 
both in our domestic food systems but also in our understanding of international food systems, we've realized if we don't invest in soil and we keep the runoff going and we keep the, you know, the chemicals pouring on, that is not the answer to long-term food security. And, and there is investigation in connecting our gut biome with the soil. With the biome in the soil. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And we're, we're really connected to the earth. Well, it's amazing even it's in amazing. the last year yeah. how much I've seen about the, you know, probiotic, prebiotic. And I mean, it's all kind of that. It's all that, but it's funny because it's, it, you know, it's great marketing for a lot of companies. It's just like eat healthy, real food. <laughs> right. And you got it. Right. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, and, but, but it is funny how we as consumers are like, wait, it's like high fiber, no GMO, prebiotic something. Okay, I'll buy it. You know what yeah. I mean? Well, it's maybe it's just like yogurt with fruit in it. Yeah. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Good point. Yeah. Good point. The other one was how do you how do you foresee us balancing the edu educating adults who might have children versus educating the children directly? Like, I mean, I remember people when I was I had economics in high school, but people always said they should have personal finance should actually be the class. Who cares about economics? What happens to your wallet? We had home ec in school, but we never had food education. Where does that come into play? It's versus just teaching the adults and hoping they teach their children versus just teaching the kids. You had home ec? I had home ec too. Wow. Yeah. I thought that was dead in the water. No, we, most that. of what we did was try to figure out how to get pasta to stick to the ceiling. <laughs> like if you see, like seriously, that's definitely what we did. And it does work. <laughs> if it's the right al dente consistency. <laughs> um, but, but no, I mean, it's interesting because you, he, I, I often, there's people that are so focused on, you know, kids, 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 and then going home. But then what's sad is if you're focusing on giving kids healthier food in school, but they won't eat it because nothing that they're eating at home reflects any of the stuff that's the healthier mm -hmm. school meal. It's very hard, you know, they're going to reject it and then it's going to look like a failure. But the flip side is if parents are at home banging their head against the wall to get their kids to eat healthier, but then every week in their kid's classroom is a cupcake party for someone's birthday, you know, I mean, it's, it's really a push-pull, right? Yes. But I think what's, what, what has to happen and, and what did happen and what has happened in every single major culture shift is that ha things kind of go in a demographic wave. And so I, I don't foresee that young parents of my, you know, m not every single young parent my generation. Yes, some people still will take their kids regularly to McDonald's because they have to or because it's really m the much more convenient option, I don't see most young parents regularly taking their kids to fast food, whereas I grew up going to fast food, not because my, my mom wasn't educated about food and health, but because she didn't realize. And I think that's where in demographics are very interesting, is that you don't get the mom who, who starts her child on organic milk and, that's the, and, and she gets it at Walmart, it's the only thing she can do, but she's read all about it and she wants to do the right thing. I don't think that mom is going to go back. and. In the recession, that mom didn't go back. So mm -hmm. I kind of see the demographics moving and shifting, you know, as, as we get older and as we are continuing to be the, 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 the more, more powerful consumers and then our kids grow up behind that, I actually see the wave totally going in the right direction. Um, whereas, you know, we who grew up in the 80s, the wave kind of went in the wrong direction for a while. Um, and so it's, it's, very, it's very, and of course, all different age groups are, getting interested in food in a different way. I mean, I've seen some cool entrepreneurial projects where it, retirement communities are being built around a central farm instead of a central golf course, um, which is a much better use of the land, by the way. And golf is like kind of boring to me. But, um, but, but I think that's kind of a cool you know, response that people are realizing that maybe, you know, and, and actually there's all these great data about as people age and, as, and if they garden while they age, they age better and healthier and for, so I think there's an interesting move along the entire spectrum of people, but really there's a demographic wave that, you know, this, the, there's going to be a generation of kids who doesn't grow up assuming that the happy meal is the best thing in the world. And that's, that's, I think where the change will eventually, you know, come. Well, I, th I think in the same way that, um, television commercials are pointed at kids to, to get parents to buy, uh, sugar. Right. Cereal. It, cereal, yeah. It, we need to, we know that if we know the same truth and we feed the kids cereal, or I mean, if we feed the kids quinoa, right. the kid might go home and ask for quinoa. And, and ideally, the young parent will go, oh, I'll learn how to make quinoa. Right. Um, and I, I think that's happening, as you say. Uh, yeah, I really do. I yeah. really do think that's happening. Yeah. And, and, it, and it's also, 
this is where I get frustrated that a lot of people point to, you know, an elitist element of food and it's just mm. not true. Mm. I mean, really it's not true. It's, um, there are barriers right now because the, the, the other system, the, the system that is the, the, you know, the structure of our current food system is highly subsidized and that makes it harder mm. for the, the mom who doesn't have as, met, as much, you know, money to, to, to just, you know, throw her hands up and say, okay, like, let's just go get, you know, the expedient thing. But the fact that Walmart is only expanding, continuous, continuing to expand mm. its organic options is showing that every single demogra every single group of people, of eaters, in, especially in our country, is realizing, is learning about this. People are not dumb. They might not have as much financial resources, but they are not, they're not asleep to the changes that probably need to happen for them and their, and their family's diet. And I, and I think that's also really important to remember that, you know, it's so easy to just say, well, well, poorer people can't afford organic food, but the poorer people couldn't afford cell phones either until cell phones were made in a way that the system made it so that everybody could get a cell phone, you know, and, and, and food has to follow that. The entrepreneurs have to come in, the systems have to be built, mm. the food options have to be available, and then everybody can afford it. Wonderful. And the point. policies have to change. <laughs> Can't forget that. Oh, that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Any other? Uh, yeah. What, um, what do you see as the the most promising policy directions for making making the good options that the chief wants? To do? Well, you know what, what's been interesting is the now what's now kind of in debate, but I think the especially at the USDA, um, there, there was a, a, a great leader, Kathleen Merrigan, who was there and was really kind of a voice for the more sustainable food movement. And the fact that she was even picked to be in, at the USDA in a senior position was pretty interesting um, because that's you know, a pretty radical shift away from a former Monsanto executive, which everybody else around her probably was. <laughs> um, but I think you know, what people have seen through the First Lady's leadership and the school food shifts is actually much bigger than just school food. The buying power and the legislation around how school food is purchased really has set the tone for a lot of the rest of our food system. So an example of that is that, you know, we used to have rules that you couldn't, a school district couldn't preference a, a local or regional uh, source for their food supply. And those rules changed in the last few years. So now they can preference a local or regional source which, I mean, is such a no-brainer, right? But, 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 but that big food service would now say, oh, I can look to my local community and say, what, what are the farmers growing? Can I buy that instead of just whatever the commodity product is for the DOD fresh offering? You know, so, so that, at that level, the policy changes to help schools get healthier food, first of all, into their cafeterias, and then eventually to the kids, is, pretty, is a pretty big change. Um, I mean, it's not anywhere near the changes that we need in school food, but I think that's a really interesting, and it, it seems like, you know, there are still, of course, now people are debating this and saying, oh, kids should, ha parents should have the choice, because the choice argument is so ridiculous, because there's no choice when there's subsidies. I mean, it's a completely false choice, because you're, you know, everyone is very influenced by the pricing differentials, but... Um, but, but I do think that the fact that some movement in school food has, has been able to be successful is a very big indication that mm -hmm. people are recognizing that this is, this change, these changes are going to happen. And, and you know, they, they need to happen. What's the, what's the one thing that could trip us up? You're saying this wave is happening, the demographics are right. What, what's our vulnerability? I think our big vulnerability is just how in deep we've gotten with monocultures of very mm -hmm. few crops. Mm -hmm. You know, corn, soy, wheat, cotton. Kind of sums it up. And and one variety of each. <laughs> yes, exactly. And you know, <laughs> right. the, exactly. The least of so soy and corn, the GMO version of, of yep. those crops. I, the, the, the power that that one variety of one crop now has mm -hmm. in our food system is just I mean, it's insane, mm -hmm. but what's, what's, what's happened, what's interesting, I mean, I, I framed the ethanol debate in terms of answering this question, that we had so, we've, we've just grown so much corn, we've been so good at growing corn. Farmers were told, grow corn, fencer to fencer out, and they did it. Which, by the way, means that if you tell them something else, they can do that too, they're really, far, our American farmers are really smart, entrepreneurial, hardworking people. 
whatever we, the eaters, ask them to grow, they'll grow, <laughs> you know? But what they've been asked to grow is, is tons of corn. And when corn has fallen out of favor, maybe in soft drinks or in, you know, people are eating more grass-fed meat or wh whatever the shifts are, we find uses for it. Instead of thinking, well, maybe we should just stop growing as much corn. Mm. We've put it in our cars, we send it overseas more and more to, you know, hungry kids or to other markets. And it's not just the global marketplace at work, it's subsidies at work. And it's us finding ways for these very few crops because we're so dependent on this system instead of us saying, let's just shift the system. And I, that's, I think, the biggest fear is that there won't ever be enough political will to fight the entrenched power of that system and get farmers to really have the ability to shift what they're growing mm. and make real money and, and a living growing other things that are healthier. Mm. So monocropping and growing on unbelievable scales, right? Just huge. Huge. I mean, just, yeah. and just these, you know, these few crops that are literally dominating our diet yeah. and, and the global diet in such a big way yeah. and the power that that brings those companies. So that's why part of my argument is that disempowering those few yeah. stakeholders by not buying those crops is a way around, is a way to shift the balance of power at least. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's very small at, at first but it has to happen because if we don't pull money out of those industries, the industries we're gonna have the most money, they're gonna be the largest voice in Washington. Mm -hmm. I've got a, a question. So I, I'm surprised that you said that our food choices aren't part of the problem. And the reason we grow so much corn and soy is to feed animals. And that with meat requiring 20 times as much protein from plants to make a pound of protein from meat, with that 20 to one multiplier effect, I don't see how, unless we change our uh, eating habits to shift away from meat, we can have a sustainable world, so enough to feed the whole world. I think even if we ate what Americans think of as a healthy diet, the world couldn't eat that way. There's not enough land, even if it's grass-fed, and that takes even more land. So I think that there, there really are some fundamental uh, issues with a meat-based economy. Well, meat based diet that, that have to be looked at. Yeah, I don't argue that at all, actually. What I argue is that choice is not the issue because American consumers are being told that you can have the, the choice to buy a 99 cent hamburger. When we agree, I'm sure, that that's not realistic. A hamburger doesn't actually cost 99 cents, it can't. If you actually, you know, added in the real cost of growing all that corn, the real cost of all the petrochemicals that are involved, the real cost of you know, the, 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 the drugs it takes to keep the animals alive, the real cost of the uh, transportation to get the animal back and forth to all the different places it goes before it gets to your plate. That's not built into the cost. Therefore, it's a false choice. It's letting people think that we can eat meat at this level from an economic perspective, and we can't. You're exactly right. We can't eat the amount of meat that we eat and the way we eat it without high levels of subsidies going into these products from so many different le from so many different places. And so what I'm arguing is that if the consumer saw the real price of that meat, we, we, we actually couldn't afford to eat it every day. We, you know, and, and, and therefore, we would eat less of it and we'd eat better quality. And therefore, the rest of the world wouldn't be sold down the river that you can produce meat in this way and, and, and all these hamburgers just overflowing from McDonald's every single day or all these, you know, the, whatever other places there. So, so I think we're, we're, I'm looking at it from the perspective that if we the consumer, we the eater knew really what the cost of that burger was, we couldn't choose to have it as often as we, as we do. And then our, our eating habits of course would have to change and would change because that would mean that our diets would reflect more of what makes rational sense from what we can grow and, and what we can afford. Um, so, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I mean, it's, it's, it's sad that, you know, we're coming to this place from a health perspective now after we've sold, you know, China and Brazil and, 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 and India and Africa and, and the, you know, all these other population rich places with our diet and our systems. Now all of a sudden we're coming to this realization that, oh wait, maybe this diet and this system doesn't work there very well. And so you know, if you look at actually the, 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 the data, Americans are actually eating less meat. But, but, but I mean, right, it's not a dramatic change, but, but it is, it's, it's a down, downward slope. And it, you know, it's a shame that we've been pushing the upward slope to everybody else 
before we kind of realize this, but I, I do think that if we radically change, if Americans wake up to these issues and really change the type of meat that we eat, the quantities in which we eat it, we don't waste it. We, we change the way our, our meat is produced and we have a little bit more concern for the environmental and also the humanitarian and animal you know, welfare elements of the way we've been producing meat. That, is a, that's a, that has the ability to radically change the way we Americans eat meat. The hope is, can that then be reflected in, in the global marketplace and how the rest of the world eats meat also? Just pulling our money. And we, I mean, we are pulling our money away from that system by not buying corn-based products in the same way, by not buying, you know, the, the so, I mean, buying soda helps feed into that system. You know, I mean, it's so interconnected. Buying high fructose corn syrup conquered jelly <laughs> instead of a real jam feeds into that system. So it's amazing how interconnected and how, you know, expansive it is. But I, I would say that if we, if we look at the system and we say, where can I remove my lobbying dollars from that, you know, that, that system, that, the, the powers that be, that I think is the way that the consumer can help break the stranglehold on Washington and on policies that these very few interests have. And, and so, so I, I would argue that you get people from the health, from the personal, from the community, from the, my genes don't fit. And then you can bring them to, oh, the reason for all of this, the reason we've gone so far off the rails, the reason that we now have this raging obesity crisis that literally didn't exist before is because of this system. And here's the system, and here's the players, and here's how we change it, and call your congressperson. <laughs> you know, but, but I do think we, one thing I've been frustrated by, especially working on global aid issues, is you've got a lot of people that really mean well and care about helping to feed the hungry but then I would argue eat in a way that perpetuates the systems that keep people hungry. A great example of that is you know, eating the, the typical uh, sort of cheap bananas and coffee and sugar that we all eat every day it really hurts some of the, 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 the largest populations of hungry people that are right to our south that then end up become, become, becoming immigrants. You know, Honduras and Guatemala are places that grow our food. We want them to grow our food cheap. We don't want to pay them real prices for that food. We get pissed that they or their kids are coming and, Im and immigrating here, and then we go to Washington to, to bitch about the immigration, instead of saying, let's actually look at this whole system here and realize that maybe if we actually paid a fair price for all the hard work that these people are doing to grow our food, <laughs> and, to, and, 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 and a realistic system is set up where people can actually be you know, compensated for all of this, you know, incredible variety that we have in our supermarkets, maybe then we wouldn't have the downstream political effects. And I think that's the same thing we, we, we need to come to with the big picture food policy issues too. You know, until people realize that there are only four major meat companies, there are, there's one dairy company controls 40% of the dairy market, including a huge chunk of the organic market. You know, until people realize that, we're not going to get them to, to, to understand what that means when, when they should call their congressperson. Um, so, you know, I, yeah, so I, I'm certainly arguing that we've got to get the, the dollars to shift. And I know that there are also, you know, amazing organizations and people that are totally focused on the high level political shifts too. But we have to pull the dollars out. We can't just say, hey, congressperson, change until we pull the dollars out. Thank you so much. Thank you. For being with us. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Thank you.